This is episode 45 of the Untangled Faith podcast. Actually, by, by speaking the truth about what has been done in private or, or sometimes in public, we are actually making space for the light to shine and for the church to be healthy. And I don't, if, if we trust that Jesus is Lord and that God is kind and good, we do not have to be afraid of looking at the darkness. This is Amy Fritz, and you're listening to Untangled Faith, a podcast for anyone who has found themselves confused or disillusioned in their faith journey. If you want to hold on to your faith while untangling it from all the things that are not good and true, this is the place for you. In December of 2021, I pre-ordered a book that wasn't going to come out until June of 2022. I don't know how many people pre-order books this far ahead, but I was so excited about this book. As soon as I saw it was available for pre-order, I bought it. The book I'm talking about is The Lord is My Courage, Stepping Through the Shadows of Fear Toward the Voice of Love by K.J. Ramsey. In this book, K.J. shares for the first time some of the religious trauma their family experienced. And I'm so thrilled to have her on the podcast for the first time. But first, I want to mention a few of our sponsors. The Untangled Faith Podcast is brought to you by my listeners who support me on Patreon. This episode is also sponsored by Faithful Counseling. Earlier this year, after putting it off for far too long, I started seeing a counselor, and it's made a huge difference for me. Faithful Counseling is a Christian counseling service with thousands of licensed therapists across all 50 states with access by video or phone sessions or chat or text. There are therapists with expertise in trauma, depression, family conflicts, and more. You can ask for a new counselor at any time and financial aid is available for those who qualify. Untangled Faith podcast listeners get 10% off their first month from our sponsor, Faithful Counseling. Go to faithfulcounseling.com slash untangled. Fill out a questionnaire and you'll be matched with a counselor. That's faithfulcounseling.com slash untangled. KJ Ramsey is one of those interview guests that was inevitable. If you've been listening for a while, you've probably heard her husband, Ryan Ramsey. He's been a guest a couple of times, and I'm sure we'll have him back. It felt only right to kick off my conversation with KJ with a question about Ryan. The first thing I wanted to ask you as we get started is even about your book. It's about how I reached out to you, I don't know, a year-ish ago, and I wanted to talk to you and your husband. You were busy. You were not in a season of doing like interviews or anything, but I got Ryan on the podcast. I don't know if he'd ever been on one before. I don't think so. (laughs) So I just want to know what it has been like for the world to see and interact with your husband's work with, you know, people love Ryan Ramsey. (laughs) Yes. And I love it. Um, I love watching people love Ryan Ramsey because he is, he's a very private man and (laughs) Like, he's the kind of person that doesn't just take up all the space in a room or in a conversation. Like, he's always been, from the first day that I met him, the person that, like, if you're in a group of people talking and he finally says something, everybody listens because he's Mm -hmm. been quietly, like, honoring what everyone has said the whole time. And I've always loved that about him. Um, So yeah, it's been so fun to watch people get to know this person that I love so much. And like, I get to hear his wisdom all the time um, and see his heart. And it's been really beautiful to watch him let people see that um, online. And then selfishly as a author, like it's been part of our process together in our marriage that like, you know, first he was really not sure about the whole like 
having to have a presence online thing. And mm-hmm. it's been it's been kind of nice as his wife for him to experience that there is goodness in gathering people online and sharing work online. Like we both say it's not neutral. Right. There's a lot of bad and there's a lot of ways that being online and being on social media shapes us negatively. And yet there's also good and there's also like room to honor people who have been harmed by others. Um, So yeah, selfishly, it's been kind of nice for him to kind of like get a little bit what I do. (laughs) Yes. And I've seen you both model such really healthy, intentional boundaries in that area. It has been really great to watch. Mm. And the fact that there is this really sweet little pocket of fellowship in the online world when it comes to people that have experienced some sort of religious trauma in, in a part of the world where people have felt like they have lost their voice. There's been a place for people to find it a little bit, and it's been really really lovely. Yeah, it is really lovely. Um, One of the things I have loved about social media is seeing you work out all your thoughts in a way that we're like, oh, KJ might be writing a book (laughs) that is interesting. (laughs) How does that work for you? How do you, Um, how do you do that? Do you like try out ideas first or you're like, I'm going to write this. I know I'm going to do it, but I want to share a little bit along the way. How's that work? Yeah. I, I love that you picked up on this (laughs) because I, (laughs) I have long been for years I've I've used social media as like a playground, like a test site from the time that I was like trying to title my first book. I totally put something out there and just to like see how people would react to it and what what like what pissed people off, what got under their skin, yeah. what what made them feel seen. And they didn't know what I was doing, but it gave me room to direct my words very carefully toward the people that I care about. Um, so yeah, I, I'm i kind of always testing things on social media. So part of my process of the formation of the words, and, mm-hmm. and then there's a lot that I don't share um, until a yeah. book is coming out. Like I'm sharing more and more quotes from the book right now. Since I'm, it turns out, like, seem to be always writing a book, (laughs) there's always (laughs) um, something that I'm working out in the present online, in addition to, like, quietly that you won't see for two years. I just love that I can interact with people in real time so that I can have a sense of what people need and how this might, how this might land with them, but also what um what holes there are and like what's being talked Mm -hmm. about right now yeah that's one of the gifts of social media right now is you know back in the day people would be writing in their little caves not sure how it was going to land with people and you you are kind of in real time saying well I already know some of this stuff is playing out and resonating in these lives of people already there's some of yeah there's to some extent I can feel that resonance and then Mm -hmm. on the other hand like this book uh the lord is my courage there's a lot about it that people don't know about and there's a lot of like how the interplay between psalm 23 and Mm -hmm. and like nervous system regulation and talking about religious trauma and like there's the way that those things come together that i don't think people necessarily know yet and so or there's parts of it that I, where I did take some risks to really say what I think yeah. about things. And so, yeah, there's some element of like, I really don't know how this will land with yeah. people. Yeah. And yet it's okay. Well, you share personally. <laughs> so it's a vulnerable thing too. Yeah. It's vulnerable. Yeah. This book, um, you know, people said my first book was vulnerable and it was, but this book, The Lord is My Courage, is the most vulnerable stuff I've ever put in print. I mean, it mm-hmm. is, yeah, it was healing to write it. It was healing to write my other book too, but there was an element of healing to this book because of being a survivor of abuse that to be able to say out loud what some yeah. of what happened, there's so much I didn't put in the book. 
to speak the truth was healing in and of itself. This is the point in our conversation where one of KJ's dogs created mayhem by jumping up and unplugging her microphone. There was a lot of laughter and chaos, and then we gathered our thoughts and plowed ahead. Let's talk about, like, you're talking about some really serious things, you know? I mean, we, we've we got the hints, as you have shared online and, and, you know, even in the previews of the book. Like, you've experienced some deep hurt in your faith community. How did you decide what to share and what to keep, what, what goes to the public and, and when? How did you know it was time? Because I feel like you have mm-hmm. thought through this very deeply and methodically. When I think through questions to ask my guests, I try to think about the kind of questions that will lead to something of value for you, the listener. And this is a question I know many of you wrestle with. What should I share and how and when? Thank you. I think I'll start with the when, because that has been quite the process. Uh, And it's been really about what Ryan and I together feel comfortable sharing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, had this just happened to me, I probably would have started to write about it a lot sooner. And I'm really glad that I didn't. Ryan, like I said, is a really private person. And I'm really grateful that he had this instinct to, in some ways, it's it wasn't about silencing ourselves, although we definitely went back and forth about whether that oh, was yeah. happening. But he had this instinct to process a lot of this privately and yeah. in like our face-to-face relationships and with each other. And so, you know, by the time that this book comes out, it will have been four years since we resigned from the church where we were most harmed. That's in one sense, not a long time. And in the other, there's been a lot of life in those four years. So yeah, we, to decide what to share and when to share it, I think there was a long period of not talking about it publicly Yeah, that gave me and Ryan a lot of space to experience our vitriol, our rage, our disillusionment in the rawest way for ourselves and with God and with some Mm -hmm. safe people so that now what you hopefully see in the book isn't the rawest part of Mm -hmm. the rawest expression of our pain and our story, but, um, in in a way, I th- I think that there's room for the rage and there's room for rawness and there's definitely rawness to how you read it. I mean, you you will read yeah. it, and it's not like it's not simple. Uh, mm-hmm. But as a trauma informed therapist, I feel a responsibility to write in a way that takes people to the edge, but mm-hmm. not over the edge. <laughs> yes. <laughs> of <laughs> Of like what can be processed and heard and experienced and, and, and I don't say that I do that perfectly, but the way that I wanted to share our story, I wanted it to be able to companion people into their own places of loss and confusion and hurt, deep, deep hurt without fully flooding them by Mm -hmm. reading it. And part of that was done, you know, stuff that the readers will probably never notice of the way that I structured the book and the manner in which I decided to like kind of trickle out the story. But those yeah. things were really important for me. So I think I only answered one part of your question, which was yeah, like, when. We're talking when, about like when and what. Yeah. It all kind of melts together. Yeah. It does. But yeah, I, in, in another sense, this, this story was kind of just asking me to be told. So mm-hmm. when I went to write my second book, I knew that it was going to be about practicing courage. That was kind of tucked into the end of my first book. And it mm-hmm. was the thing that I was just like, I I have to explore this more. This has been my experience. I, I knew that's where I wanted to go, but I 
also knew that I didn't want my next book to like only really be about spiritual abuse. And I was like, I'm not going to write like a primer on spiritual abuse. That's not what I, I'm not interested in doing that. And this isn't the only thing I'm ever going to write about. Just like chronic illness stuff is not the only thing I'm ever going to write about. Yes. And yet what I found was as I started to work on it (laughs) and explore this, the landscape where I've most learned how to practice courage is in leaving and healing from spiritual abuse and religious Mm -hmm. trauma. It was like that story was, it it had to be told because it was the story that I have to offer. I became more confident in the telling of that story as I sat day after day in the quiet of this room and practiced telling it and and edited so very, very much. And <laughs> yes, <laughs> there's yes. so many drafts of this. I mean, for this book, probably more than my even my first, there are mountains of words that I wrote that are not in the book because yes. I needed to write them in order to get to the version of the story that is most helpful to the reader, not just to yeah. me. Yeah, and, it's just, it's, this isn't yeah. you just having a cathartic moment and no. healing yourself. Hell no. Um. No, this is not, <laughs> it's not just that. But in order to get to yeah. it being hopefully really helpful for mm-hmm. everyone else, I did have to have those cathartic moments yeah, along yeah. the way, right? There was a lot of writing and a lot of processing. And then, frankly, more rounds of editing mm-hmm. that. I will not describe all of the reasons for which there were, um, but mostly (laughs) just as a matter of taking utmost care with Mm -hmm. this kind of story um, and the way that it needs to be told for the protection of both myself and the people reading it. I had a lot of people helping me tell it well and tell it with care. I like how you said and you model the fact that uh, it it didn't have the most the first initial, all the, as raw as raw could be like early feelings, but you didn't edit out all of the rawness and that you did that in a strategic way, aware of the risk to yourself and also like weighing like how this would serve people that are reading. It makes me think this weekend I had, I had to make an editorial decision here and I've struggled over it. At this point of the conversation, KJ and I were talking about the use of cuss words in the context of describing abusive and harmful situations. I had to decide if I would leave the cuss words in or take them out. I decided to beep them out because I want to err on the side of respecting those of you who may be listening with little ears paying attention. But I also want you to know that I don't feel the need to censor others in real life as they're sharing their stories. Sometimes the ugliest words are the most appropriate. I got to listen to Lorianne Thompson, who endorsed your book, Mm -hmm. who is a lovely, fierce justice warrior, lover of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And she, before she spoke, Lorianne said, I just talked to Ruth, you know, her friend, Ruth. Mm -hmm. Ruth said, Ruth said, I'm afraid I'm going to cry. And Lorianne said, I'm afraid I'm going to (laughs) cuss. And Dr. Diane Langford was sitting at this table and she said, that sounds appropriate to me. Cussing yep. sounds appropriate to this 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 situation. And when she sat in front of everyone, she strategically knew what she was doing when she said it. She was because in my brain, this is what these people are. And she cussed. And it was the most holy moment. And there were people in that room that said to her later, Thank you for telling me I don't need to be shiny. And all yes. put together to be welcome in this community. Yes. I have found in my own process of healing that there is harm for which there are no better words than f- and yeah. f- it is so f- wrong that, and, what and has been that, done. Those words were born out of literally mean abuse yeah. of people. If there is ever an environment to use that word, this is what it literally means. Yeah. It was holy. Yes. I love that you didn't feel the need to, I love that you waited. I love that you thought through it, but that you're also like, I'm going to say some of those things that aren't pretty. Yeah. Speaking of not pretty, there's some people, a few people that will say, 
KJ, aren't we just airing dirty laundry? Aren't we making the church look bad? I am assuming you have thoughts on this. I have so many thoughts on it. Sorry, I just laughed. Um, (laughs) Sorry, not sorry. Um, Because I do care about the people who say that. And I don't want to... I I want to extend respect to them, too. Because the truth is, I think that that kind of statement exposes a real sense of scarcity within Mm. themselves and a fear of the very thing that so many of us who are sharing our stories have had to face ourselves, which is the fear of losing our belonging. So in that statement of, aren't we, are you just airing the church's dirty laundry? You're making the church look bad, all this. There's fear of, of the church collapsing, of, Mm of not having the safe, place that you want to have yeah and whether you benefit from something yeah you don't want it to be threatened right we all and that is a human reality we Mm -hmm. all feel that what i want people to know is that jesus has promised that the church is so connected to his faithfulness that the gates of hell will not prevail against it We do not have to so tightly guard this thing that Christ has promised will prevail. And when the truth is that abuse flourishes in the dark, Mm. just like fungus, just like mold, it grows in the dark. Secrets and silence actually perpetuate the very thing that we are all afraid of, which is harm and losing our belonging and not experiencing love. So actually by, by speaking the truth about what has been done in private or, or sometimes in public, we are actually making space for the light to shine and for the church to be healthy. Hmm. And I don't, if, if we trust that Jesus is Lord and that God is kind and good, we do not have to be afraid of looking at the darkness. Um, I think of Psalm 139, like even the darkness is not dark to you. God has already entered that darkness. I'm not afraid of it. I'm not afraid of it anymore. And I think keeping things under wraps actually harms everyone more than speaking of it, honestly. Hmm. I love the empathy that you have there because you're seeing the fear that is underneath that question. It's hard though, to hold both of those things to be like, I know my story might hurt you or might make you feel threatened. It's just, it's part of that growing in our, in our discipleship of it's not easy to hold all the things at the same time. I just want to say to survivors, I can it might be hard even to hear a little bit of empathy in my voice there in that mm-hmm. answer, because it's a lot of the people who are afraid of speaking of speaking the truth. They're saying like that we're just airing dirty laundry uh, have said really rude things, have gaslit us for speaking the truth and have been abusive toward us for that courageous act of truth telling. So the anger over that your anger over that is is justified and good and holy and the reason that they have done that is because they're so damn afraid yeah there's i think anger and empathy can go together we'll join kj again after this quick break do you have an idea for a great new podcast you can bring your idea to life and start your podcast today with libsyn My podcast has been on Libsyn for several months and I love it. Libsyn has everything you need to plan, launch, and grow your own podcast. Libsyn provides some of the best resources created by expert podcasters who will show you everything you need to know, like what equipment you should use, how to record great audio, how to get your show onto Apple Podcasts and other popular platforms, and much more. Plus, as a friend of the Untangled Faith podcast, 
When you sign up with Libsyn, you get your first month of podcast hosting for free. There has never been a better time than right now for you to start podcasting. Visit Libsyn.com and use the code F-R-I-E-N-D. That's L-I-B-S-Y-N.com and use code FRIEND, F-R-I-E-N-D, to get started and create your podcast today. There were so many ways KJ and I could have taken this conversation surrounding her book, The Lord is My Courage. It contains some of their story, but it also includes some really rich background that helps set Psalm 23 in context, historically and theologically. And of course, we also get some of KJ's expertise as a therapist of what it means when our bodies and minds feel or don't feel safety. Tell me about what you learned about Psalm 23. You kind of use Psalm 23 the idea of the good shepherd. I mean, everybody probably thinks they know this. They know what they already know what this, this Psalm is about. Yeah. You can use this as the scaffolding to frame this book. Well, not kind of, you did like, yeah, it is, <laughs> all it of is the actually words. the chapters. You learned a, a million things, I'm sure. So what, what are some of the highlights without spoiling I... the whole thing? Yeah. 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 Well, there's no possible way to, because there was so much, I will tell you first why I Mm -hmm. chose Psalm 23 because I think that will answer that question because it wasn't like I felt like Psalm 23 was this like solace that I always went back to or anything like that actually Psalm 23 felt trite to me Mm -hmm. and um, it just felt like okay like this is a pleasant thought I, I talk about it in the book like it's like a warm cup of hot cocoa on a cold day. Like it sits on the side table of your soul and you're like, that's a nice thought. God's a good shepherd. Like, yeah. Oh, that would be great. But is that true? I mean, come on. So that's where actually I came at the, (laughs) at all of this. I wasn't even thinking about Psalm 23 when I pitched this book, Mm -hmm. I actually gave my publisher a totally fake um, table of contents and knowing <laughs> that I was like going to figure out what I actually wanted to do along the way. Cause that's how I roll. And apparently that's more common than you would think. But what happened was in experiencing my life, I, especially with a disability and, and healing from trauma, which involves coming face to face with your own limitations I have experienced over and over again that when I show up in my life offering the little bit that I have, God blesses it. Usually there's some sort of breaking involved, Mm. a a brokenness of the experience, and then gives it to nourish more people than just me. There's a blessed, broken, given pattern. Mm -hmm. And we see that both in Jesus giving the Lord's shepherd, the Lord's supper to his, to his friends, to his disciples and the institution of, of communion, but also in when Jesus fed the crowds, um, the feeding of the 5,000. And in, in one of the tellings, actually a couple of tellings of the feeding of the 5,000, it says that Jesus had compassion on the crowd for they were like sheep without a shepherd. Mm. And that phrase, they were like sheep without a shepherd. I immediately uh, latched onto it. It captivated me. And I thought, those are my people, Mm. my people, the people that I'm writing for, whether they would call themselves this or not, are like sheep without a shepherd. Either a shepherd has harmed them or they have not been adequately shepherded. And this isn't just about pastors, but it like pastors to parents, yeah. to coaches, caregivers, like sheep without a shepherd means you have not been adequately seen mm-hmm. and cared for. And in some cases you have been harmed by people who were supposed to love you and strengthen you. Mm-hmm. Jesus fed the crowds, he had compassion on them for they were like sheep without a shepherd. So I just became captivated by Christ's compassion to feed these crowds. And then, you know, in one of the tellings of that story, this little boy who is poor because he he gives his barley bread, which is bread of the only poor people would have been eating. He, he gives Jesus his loaves and fishes 
Jesus blesses it, breaks it, gives it, feeds upwards of 15,000 people. It's not just 5,000. That's just counting the men. Yeah. Counting women and children, 15,000 people from these, this little handful that this little boy offered. And it's more than enough. So as I like traveled that story and just like let that story wind its way around me, I, I couldn't leave it. And then I knew um, I'm really bad at structure, as you can probably <laughs> tell from how I answer things. I, I knew like I wanted I wanted some sort of structure to guide people through this very mm-hmm. hard territory of of what it actually looks like to be courageous. And so on the phone one day with one of my dear friends, another author, Lori Wilbur, um, we were talking about the structure for her upcoming book, which she kind of had like this innate built-in structure. And we, I told her all about this story and how I was just so captivated by Jesus's compassion for those who were sheep without a shepherd. And we both, and I was talking about scarcity and abundance and practice and rest and all these things. And she was like, what about Psalm 23? And she started to recite it. So the Lord is my shepherd. I lack nothing. He Mm. makes me lie down. And I was like, that is everything. That is every theme I'm trying to explore. And what I found was the story that David tells in Psalm 23, the song that he sings, Jesus actually deliberately retells that story. And he also enacts the story of Psalm 23 in his life, in that, in that feeding of the 5,000, it is not only a demonstration of God preparing this Mm. table for us in the presence of our enemies, but it is a deliberate Though even the way that it is written is the same literary structure of a ring composition that Psalm wow. 23 is written in. And so what I discovered is courage is actually, it is a circle just like, so Psalm 23 is written as a, a ring composition. It's mm-hmm. a story that David tells. He tells the story in one way, and then he repeats the same story slightly differently mm-hmm. backward, forming a circle. The story that Jesus enacts does the same exact thing. And then, you know, there's actually retellings of it for a thousand year trajectory throughout scripture. And that's our lives. We're brought again and again back to these same experiences of having to practice trusting whether God actually is for us. And, And we're brought to these spaces again and again. Courage is not a one and done situation and trusting the Mm. good shepherd isn't either, but we're brought kindly back to the places where we get to experience God coming and seeking us. And it's in that circle, this repetition that our bodies, our whole selves learn to trust that God is for us and is still good and and we are still loved. Mm. So that was a very long answer. No, to, I there's I, so I, much. There's so much. <laughs> that is gonna fall on some people's heart. I, I wrote down um a quote from your book that you said um that you believe that many of us don't experience the Lord as our shepherd because we have rarely been shepherded by people who stand with us in the dirt of our distress. And I would love to talk about that because there are going to be people that are listening and reading that hear you talk about the good shepherd and they long to experience that. Mm -hmm. But what do you say to that person? And what are you seeing in our churches regarding where are the shepherds? Right. Yeah. And, and that is why I took this on because in one sense, I was slightly afraid to mm-hmm. choose yeah. Psalm 23 and talking about Jesus as a good shepherd, because I am not dumb. I know that that's the place of our pain. Yes. Like, yes. I know that me talking about it is going to hurt <laughs> because it's exactly what so many of us haven't 
experienced as true. Mm -hmm. But I decided to go directly there because it is still what is given to us in scripture as our inheritance and what we actually deserve is this good, attentive, kind presence of protection, Mm -hmm. care. That's that's what we are supposed to have. And I'm an idealist to the core. And I actually believe it's possible Um, at the same time as I have seen so much harm and I've experienced it personally too. So I think the, the comfort that I want people to hear is that I'm under no illusion that all shepherds are good. Mm -hmm. I'm under no illusion that you have received the tenderness and kindness, the sight that you actually deserve. And also there is more for, for you than you have received. There's more than harm. In fact, actually part of the Psalm is that goodness and love, goodness and love will follow after me all the days of my life. Goodness and love are Mm -hmm. written in a way that are personified and the word follow in Psalm 23 is radaf in Hebrew, mm. and it means to hound or harass. And David, who, let's be honest, not a perfect person, right. um, also experienced being exiled and harmed by another leader, uh, by King Saul. Mm-hmm. So David, who's, who's been hounded and has been harmed, like his actual life has been threatened. He uses this word. It's the only time in, in scripture that it's used this way. Usually Rudaf is used like my enemies are after me. They're chasing me. They're, they're trying to kill me. And he's usually, it's usually David writing about Saul chasing him. Mm -hmm. David flips the script on persecution. He says, God's goodness and love chase after me more than all of the people who hate me and have harmed me. Wow. So what I want people to hear is, more, more than all the harm that has happened to you, God's goodness and love are still seeking you. They're chasing you down. There is still goodness coming for you. Mm. And even with my eyes wide open to the harm that continues to happen in the 700 freaking names that the SBC hid in a secret file of shepherds who were not shepherds, who were false shepherds, Yeah. who were hired hands and devoured sheep. Even with that reality, there are people, people like you, Amy, people like Ryan, um, so many humans who actually want to care for people with the respect that they deserve. Mm -hmm. And I have experienced that care myself. And part of the book I do write about the experience of that with my own priest Mm -hmm. Um, when I came back from church, back to church after being gone for a while to help my body heal my trauma heal, Mm -hmm. um, it exists, there's goodness. And I, and I've experienced God, God's self shepherding me in the wilderness in tangible ways. Mm -hmm. Goodness and love are chasing us. Yeah. I noticed something really interesting that maybe some other people won't. I always, as somebody that loves to read, I look at who is endorsing a book and I know that you reach out to people. Like somebody doesn't mm-hmm. just randomly say, I, I, mean, oh, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe that's, maybe that's <laughs> you what you're like, yeah, I haven't you read have your book ask. yet. I'm going to endorse it. I haven't read it. Um, Not usually. <laughs> it doesn't usually work like that. Yeah. But your list of names came from all different corners of and when it comes to like liberal and progressive and conservative and, and you recently shared something on Instagram. And I think you said it was in your book too, that you feel less of a concern to gatekeep mm-hmm. about like getting all the answers exactly right. And it, it just sort of sat on my heart. Like I, I resonated with that. I used to really worry, like, what if, what if I don't get, get this, this belief exactly right. What if I don't have the right answer? And like, I feel like if I'm going to heaven, I need to know, you know, check off these different things. And, and that you wrote about, you know, this kingdom of God is bigger. And uh, tell me, tell me your thoughts on that. Were you nervous about sharing that? I, let's see, slight, just slightly. 
Okay. But I'm always, what I find for some reason, I don't know. People don't get as mad at me as I think that they will usually. And so <laughs> yeah. I've started to trust that like, you know what, you can, you can try just say, you can say what you think yeah. and yeah. I'll be okay if people are mad at me. Like I'm just being honest yeah. about where I'm at. Yeah. Um, I shared that because for me, and I think for a lot of the people, the currency of belonging has been assenting to a certain set of beliefs Mm -hmm. and if you don't you know in whatever church you're from there's there's abuse and trauma that happens across all the whole swath of the continuum of christendom everywhere fundamentalist on the right and on the left yeah okay Mm -hmm. my experience was from the more conservative end (laughs) and so Mm -hmm. where i is no longer my home um although you probably couldn't pin me down any on where I am on a lot of this, but I experienced that you have to believe a certain set of things or say that you do in order to really be included, whether Mm -hmm. that is as a leader, um, to be allowed to lead a small group or God forbid preach. I wouldn't have been able to, I wouldn't have been allowed to preach as a woman in the, in the, um, communities that we were part of but there's this pressure to like get things right because getting things right actually is how you get to belong Mm. in so many communities and that should not be the case like we belong because we were born we belong because god has named us as his beloved yeah. children. Mm-hmm. We belong because of baptism. We belong for reasons that are beyond our conception and are irrevocable. Yeah. And so, yeah, I, there are things that I believe today. There are things I do not know today mm-hmm. that like my 10 years ago self would have been probably more than a little squirmy about yeah. if I encountered me 10 years ago. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, I've, I've just seen, I have seen the harm that happens when we use belief and a set of beliefs as the currency of belonging. And I'm calling it bullshit. There are beliefs that matter and they're summarized in things like the Nicene Creed and the Apostles Creed. And that is what I know. Yeah. And I think there's a lot beyond there that we don't know there's a lot that there's a beautiful mystery to what is in our sacred scriptures yeah and I look to Jesus as the one who gets to be he says I am the gate for the sheep um he's the gatekeeper not me he gets to decide he gets to decide and I do not have to be standing by that gate holding my hands out ready to close it yeah on somebody that might see things slightly differently than me. Yeah. That gate is not, it is not my responsibility. Yeah. And if I spend all my energy standing by it, I'm going to miss out on lying down in the green pastures that mm. were prepared for me and for you. That's really beautiful. I, as I see people grow in their face, what I'm seeing more and more is a comfort with a lack of certainty about some things. And it's Mm -hmm. more things than I think people would have thought they would be uncertain about and saying, I just, I don't know. I don't know. I think this, this is what I think about this. I, but I could be wrong. And there's a real holiness to that. I don't know thing, the mystery. There is. And I think that experiencing spiritual abuse or religious trauma or both, they, oh, they overlap in large, large ways, um, can actually be like doubt and death, something I think I wrote in the book, or maybe it's in my next book. Doubt and death are doorways. And it's these experiences of of the death of our relationships, the death of our dreams, the death of some safety that actually Mm -hmm. can be a door into this beautiful freedom, this beautiful mystery of not knowing because there's so much to what you've lived, Amy, there's so much to what I've lived that I cannot make sense of. Yeah. 
I will never be able to make sense of why someone who calls himself a shepherd decided to treat us so terribly and not just us, but so many people. I won't understand that. I won't understand why I have a freaking disease Mm -hmm. now, maybe a few more. And like, I won't ever understand it. Yeah. I don't have to understand it to experience being loved within it. Yeah. And that I think the raising the like acceptance of all that I can't know gives me room to receive compassion here, like in my finitude of knowledge and that compassion, that experience of compassion in the not knowing like there's a beauty to it and a, a solace that I would not trade for certainty Mm. ever. Dr. Langberg said that she was assigned the the talk to talk about like, like, why, (laughs) why did this happen? Why did God allow this? You know, she's been doing trauma therapy for five decades. Mm -hmm. And her answer was, I don't know. Yeah. That is my answer too. Yeah. And nobody was mad about it. Nobody was mad. We'd like an answer, but there is something that's really reassuring when you know, somebody's just given you an answer that doesn't make sense. I'd much rather hear. I don't know. Uh, she, yeah. Dr. Langberg is, she's yeah. a treasure. Well, she's, she is. And I mean, Ryan and I seeing one of her videos about spiritual abuse in, in a system. Um, oh my word. Like systemic abuse was actually the thing that like moved us while we were in our abusive church system to own. Like this I have a, is what I have a happening. similar experience, narcissism yeah. and the system it breeds watching it. Yep. Yeah. I'm pretty sure that was the one yeah. and looking at my husband it, and going, and my husband's like, Hey, you know, this is us, right? <laughs> yep. is where, that's, I was like, that's what we did too. Oh, we no. had that moment. And that's why I'm like, that's what I'm trying to offer is just like what we get. And I think this is part of what I'm saying. Courage is it's like you offer up that little bit you have. She offered that up. It changed the trajectory of our life because it gave us room to see that like, this is real. Even if we don't understand why it's here, it's real. This is what's happening. And it does not have to be this way. And I'm trying to offer that up in this book that like, this is real. You are loved. It doesn't have to be this way. Mm -hmm. There is a way through the valley and there's a shepherd that is calling your name and is seeking you. Having KJ kick off this podcast season has been such a joy for me. I would love for you to order her book, The Lord is My Courage, Stepping Through the Shadows of Fear Toward the Voice of Love. I'll have a link in the show notes for you. If you love this conversation with KJ, I have great news. KJ and I keep talking in some bonus audio I'm sharing with the Patreon membership community. But first, I want to wrap up this episode with a quote from KJ's new book. We who have been scattered, whose lives have been shattered, and who wonder if we ever mattered to God. Are being sought by the shepherd right in the places that sting, where our stomachs rumble and our souls quake. The good shepherd still looks out over the crowd of sheep with on a shepherd and feels so much compassion he is compelled to act. As we sit on the hillsides where it seems hope might be lost, we are positioned exactly where small offerings overshadow scarcity to soothe and strengthen us into seeing, even just for a day, The kingdom of God is in our midst. The Untangled Faith podcast is created and hosted by me, Amy Fritz. It is underwritten in part by our family budget, as well as through supporters of the show on Patreon, including Michelle Pionic, who supports the show as a producer. If you appreciate this work, I would love for you to join us as a supporter of the show. You can learn more about that at patreon.com slash untangled faith. That's also where you can access all the bonus audio that is only shared with patrons. Don't forget to check out untangledfaithpodcast.com for all the show notes. Thanks for listening and I'll see you next week.